Members, the next item of business is a motion to approve a statutory rule. I will ask the clerk to please read the motion. That the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 4, Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, be approved. Thank you. I call the Minister for Health, Mr Robin Swan, to move the motion. Moved. Thank you. The Business Committee has agreed that there should be no time limit in this debate. I call upon the Minister to open the debate on the motions. Minister. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, the, the motion before us today, the amendment regulations before the Assembly today, have placed additional restrictions upon gatherings of private homes within a defined period, which is referred to as the emergency period, and within a defined geography, which is referred to as the protected area. As members will recall, these restrictions were initially introduced solely for Belfast and specific postcodes in the Ballymena, Glenavy, Lisburn and Crumlin areas on the 10th of September. BT60 was then added on the 18th of September and they have subsequently been applied across Northern Ireland from the 21st of September and remain in place. The restrictions imposed by these regulations relate solely to the domestic sphere. They limit social interaction in homes and gardens with the intention of preventing the spread of coronavirus. Principally, the regulations state that in respect of the protected area, no one may participate in a gathering indoors in a private dwelling, which consists of persons from more than one household and no one may participate in gathering outdoors at a private dwelling which consists of more than six persons or which consists of persons from more than two households. A number of important exemptions are applied, allowing gatherings to take place outside these limits in a number of specific cir circumstances. These are where all the people in the gathering are members of a bubble, and the regulation provides the definition of bubbling, or when people are gathering for a number of specific purposes, being that for childcare, or for building or maintenance works, or the provision of a trade or profession at the home, or for providing care or assistance to a vulnerable person, or giving or receiving legal advice or assistance, or fulfilling a legal obligation, or the provision of emergency or medical assistance to any person, or a marriage or a civil partnership where one of the couple is terminally ill, or a funeral or an event associated with a funeral, or a house move. At the same time, advice was given to those living within the affected areas to avoid unnecessary travel outside the protected areas. Care homes and hospitals in these areas were advised to significantly curtail visits as soon as practical, so that one member of a family is permitted a visit once a week while these restrictions apply. Medically vulnerable and older people living in these areas have also been asked to be particularly careful in following the advice on limiting household contacts, social distancing, hand washing and wearing a face covering, given the local levels of COVID-19. These regulations place a significant imposition upon individuals and families, preventing them from socialising at home. The Executive does not take these measures or any measure like them likely, but the regulations are made for the purpose of preventing greater harm through the spread of the virus and the sickness and deaths of others. The deterioration of the situation since the 10th of September has meant that the localised restrictions have now been applied across all of Northern Ireland, and even further restrictions have been brought to bear in the Derry City and Strabane Council area, commencing a week ago. This is the current direction of travel, reflecting the increased levels of infection and the increased risks to health. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would take like at this point uh, to read a number of things into the record. And that's to alert members that the average number of new positive tests per day over the last seven days has increased from 241.4 to 518.6, a doubling. The seven days incidence based on new positive cases is per 100,000 is up from 88.9 to 191.1, a doubling again. The seven days average number of total tests of which are positive across both pillars. Seven days ago was 4.1 per cent, and the last hour paper was 8.94 per cent, more than a doubling. The number of new positive tests in the over 60s in the last seven days is up from 189 to 420. The first COVID positive hospital admission in the last week is up from 43 to 77. The seven-day average number of COVID-occupied hospital beds is up from 44.7 to 76.1, and the number of community-acquired COVID inpatients is up 
from 51 to over 130 today. Mr Deputy Speaker, in regards to commentary that is um, in the public domain and has been made um, public, um, I firmly believe that the decisions taken by the Executive should be had and dealt with in the Executive and not in the media. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I can inform this House that I provided the First and Deputy First Minister with detailed recommendations as to where we think uh, decisions should be taken in regards to the Department of Health. And I can confirm that I submitted a paper yesterday evening to the First and Deputy First Minister spelling out the detailed advice from the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Advisor. That paper recommends decisive action be urgently taken to save lives, prevent the health service being overwhelmed and protect non-COVID services to the greatest extent possible. Mr Deputy Speaker, we all in this House realise that these are complex issues and need to take into account a number of perspectives and implications. The role of our Chief Medical Officer and Chief Scientific Advisor is to provide advice from the health perspective. Other sectors will quite properly have additional issues and concerns. Mr Deputy Speaker, it is ultimately for the Executive to consider all factors together. It is not or it would not be helpful to focus on any of these perspectives in isolation, and I will continue to respect the Executive by not making public um, the guidance that we give to it public before it has had time for executive discussion. Mr Deputy Speaker, the purpose of this debate is to allow members to examine the terms of this set of regulations and to debate their merits. And I welcome the opportunity to address these issues in the Chamber, and I look forward to the contribution of colleagues. Before I call the next speaker, in a previous debate on coronavirus regulations, it was rightly and accurately pointed out that uh, the junior minister had 10 minutes, 85% of which was used to discuss stuff not related to the measures he was actually announcing. Similarly, I think that the minister went a wee, a wee bit further than just these measures, so therefore I will show some leeway to members because I think if a minister uh, expands on a theme, then I think it's only fair that, that members should be allowed to as well. I call the chair of the Health Committee, Mr Colin Gildernew. Thank you for that. Um, and I suppose I want to start my remarks today by just reflecting on the very grave situation that, that the Minister has outlined in relation to the number of cases, in relation to some of the key metrics doubling at a rate which, which is of significant concern. I also want to give my condolences to everyone who has lost a loved one since the start of this as a result of COVID-19, and also that our thoughts are with those who have tested positive in recent times and all of the anxiety and stress and difficulty that that brings to them and their families, and uh, that our thoughts are with those also. So I'd like to start by thanking the Minister, his officials and the wider health and social care workforce for their relentless work on our behalf to tackle this pandemic, to keep us safe and to protect our health service and the vast array of services delivered daily without fanfare. As outlined by the Minister, these regulations put in place the enhanced restrictions that initially applied to a limited number of areas defined by postcode and have since been extended. While acutely aware of the need for effective measures to curb the rising infection rates, the Health Committee found these regulations challenging and we considered them on two occasions before coming to a view. While we agreed to lend our support today, the Committee also agreed that I should put on record a number of concerns. The first challenge was the issue of access to the evidence, modelling and advice behind these and other coronavirus regulations. When these regulations come before the Executive, Ministers weigh up the merits of the proposals based on advice from senior departmental officials, who we are advised trawl a range of scientific papers and present a summary indicating the rationale and presumably modelling anticipated costs and impact of these measures. The Health Committee, on the other hand, has been asked to come to its view without access to this critical information. This is all the more important given the haste with which some of these measures are having to be put in place with no time for consultation. 
Despite challenging the adequacy of information provided in relation to a series of these regulations, officials could not advise if the Committee's request for access to relevant papers has yet been relayed to the Executive. The Health Committee believes it should be equipped with all relevant information in order to perform its statutory duty to scrutinise the legislation before it. And just for the avoidance of doubt, I will say that this scrutiny allows us to play a role in terms of assessing what measures have had an impact how those, and, and what lessons can be learned for the future. So we are, not, we are not undermining the fact that many of these restrictions are necessary. What we are saying is that we want to be able to learn and to implement the lessons from that as a result of having good evidence and applying our scrutiny function. Moreover, in view of the impact the regulations have on people's lives, I think there are potential benefits to be gained in being as transparent as possible about the underpinning analysis on which the regulations are based in terms of securing and maintaining the also important public buy-in at what is an undoubtedly difficult time. The second challenge for the committee is that these regulations provide that subsequent changes to the list of postcodes covered could then be done by direction. This means, as members know, that there is no assembly or committee oversight. Indeed, the directions listing new postcodes were placed on a website and not even copied to the committee. The committee might have had less concern if the directions were making minor technical arrangements, but these directions do have a significant impact on people's family and lives. I want to be clear, the issue is not about the merits of the enhanced restrictions nor their legal validity, but about how reasonable it is to extend significant legal obligations to different communities by simple ministerial decision without any possibility of the committee or indeed this House asking questions or taking a view. Again, this must be considered in light of my earlier point about access to departmental analysis. The committee would want me to stress, I'm sure, our understanding of the need to be agile in such difficult circumstances, but the question is whether this is the right balance between agility and scrutiny. Further to discussion, we remain uncertain that laying new SRs to adjust these restrictions, as has been the case in dealing with all the other restrictions, would be unworkable. The committee has asked the department to look again at this approach and only use directions were absolutely essential. And I would like to note that the Derry and Straban uh, increased restrictions were brought in by statutory regulation and on behalf of the committee I welcome that, that that approach we believe is a sounder approach. The committee also sought and received an assurance from officials with regard to communication of future directions. Considering then now the rules on linked household or bubbles, the committee discussed with the examiner of statutory rules the necessity and the proportionality of prohibiting a household from forming a new bubble with a second household should a first bubble break down. While members recognised that the exemption would be open to abuse if there were no restrictions in place, we asked officials to consider the merits of amending the legislation to enable a new bubble to be formed after a safe period of time had elapsed. Officials helpfully reminded the committee that, in addition to linked households, a further exemption exists to allow a vulnerable person to receive care and support in their homes. He further pointed out that a vulnerable person is deliberately undefined to allow for some reasonable interpretation. A member did suggest, and, and rightly so, that isolation as distinct from curing needs, from, from pure curing needs, should be further considered in terms of the exemptions and the current limits to forming linked households. Again, the Chief Environmental Officer did offer that he would give this issue further thought. Finally, the committee discussed with officials the growing body of evidence regarding transmission of the virus. The Chief Scientific Advisor told us that whereas it initially seemed the majority of infections resulted from household transmission, presently, the largest volume of cases appear to be occurring through community transmission. He went on to explain that community transmission is a broad category comprising a range of settings including sports and hospitality, but not workplaces. The committee has requested a further breakdown of the evidence on transmission, although we understand it is often impossible to be categorical about where the virus was acquired and we will be discussing the information gleaned through contact tracing this week with the Public Health Agency. In closing, I would reiterate the Committee's unwavering commitment to working constructively with the Minister and our solidarity with those, all those working to provide leadership and clear public messaging at this critical time. I would again encourage everyone to stay informed, 
to reduce their social contacts where possible, and to continue to observe the basic precautions of washing hands, re reducing social contacts, and observing social distancing. Finally, last Jan Corlea, in terms of, of uh, my own role as Sinn Féin health spokesperson, I would like to once again reiterate the fact that there is a large body of very worrying evidence out there in relation to the spread of coronavirus and its potential and actual impact now on the health service. Um, we know that our health service operates at, at very tight capacities at times over the winter in normal years, and we now have the additional element of COVID, both in terms of admissions and, very, very critically, in my view, in terms of hospital staffing levels, which are going to be challenged. We also know that we are seeing increases of the virus within the care home settings, and that uh, we, we have limited capacity around many of our health, uh, health services and that those must be protected. We all recognise the need to also protect, and the Minister has acknowledged that he is working very hard to protect all of the other services. But uh, I just would like to indicate on behalf of the committee and on behalf of, of ourselves our support for these uh, re regulations today. I call Mrs Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And uh, just at the outset, I want to also uh, put my condolences on the record as well for all those who have lost lives, the, the families of those who have lost lives in, in recent days, and unfortunately will continue to as time goes on. The regulations before us today represent uh, another attempt at getting ahead of the virus and indeed trying to control the spread amongst our community. In recent days, we have seen new positive cases rise to over 1,000 per day, and that is a very worrying trend now. It reminds us all how this virus transmits so quickly. It would be a, a daily warning alert to uh, follow guidance, and that's what we have to do. We need to do the right thing. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, we were told that much of the transmission was within households and hence the regulations we have before us today were adopted. I think we all struggle with the restrictions on letting people into our homes. The Ulster people are hospitable people and it's against our nature to let someone stand at the door and not bring them in and offer them a cup of tea and a chat. But yet it is just those sort of natural daily occurrences that we are told are spreading COVID. So we have to say no. I do welcome the bubbling concept. I think it's especially uh, good for those who are uh, single, live on their own at home, uh, for whom this has been a very lonely time in recent months and a difficult time. It's vital that those that, who have care needs in particular can bubble with one other household, so that is to be welcomed. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, we also look at the regulations here today in relation to business and who amongst us has not been inundated with calls and emails from businesses quite simply fighting to keep the doors open. It is a deeply worrying time and the latest cautions from my colleague, the Economy Minister, should serve as a warning to us that if we restrict businesses, that, that must be at a last resort. And yes, of course, it does go without saying that lives need protecting, but we must learn to do that while also protecting livelihoods. How do we expect these businesses to survive? How do we expect employers to keep paying employees when the cash simply isn't in the takings? And to be blunt, how can we expect the government to keep picking up the tab? We need to learn to live with COVID, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Protect health and people, but also protect society, protect jobs and family incomes. We need a balance and we need individually, and each of us have individually that power to provide that balance. Key to finding this balance is driving home the key messages, washing your hands, wearing a face covering, social distance. Self-isolate if you have symptoms and book a test. Follow the regulations, follow the guidance. Too many times in recent weeks I've been told of examples where people with symptoms or awaiting a result have been out and about in public spaces, and this is simply wrong. I say stop it, wise up, for your actions prolong this period of public health risk and economic turmoil. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, we need to monitor the impact of these regulations closely and decide what elements work and those that do not. We also need to keep mental health and the desperate loneliness that isolation brings as a priority in our considerations. I also encourage whatever actions are needed to keep our health service open, from GPs to the surgeon, to scans, 
to, from the scans to the chemotherapy and physiotherapists. We need our health service functioning for all who need it. We cannot shut down like before and leave the sick to get sicker, the prognosis to d deteriorate. To do so would be seriously wrong. So let's look at, I would su respectfully suggest, requesting army medical support, if that will bolster our health service and keep those vital elective care, including cancer operations, going in the second wave of coronavirus. I do at this point want to, to thank the minister and the executive and the chief scientific officer the Chief Medical Officer for their continued effort at what is an unenviable task. And I would, however, respectfully ask the Health Minister what preparation he and his department have made in order to deal with the bed capacity in particular with the ongoing crisis of our healthcare system. We've known about this from early this year, and it would be good to hear what exactly he has done in terms of pre preparation uh, taking us forward and what we knew was already coming in the second wave. It's vital that a way is found to um, ensure that essential health care can continue, as highlighted by the Royal College, College of Surgeons just last week, to avoid preventable non-COVID deaths as well as COVID deaths. Thank you. I call Ms Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker. I rise to support the motion um, as it is an important tool to help fight the cause of COVID. The Minister is undoubtedly it's a worrying time with significant rises in cases and hospital admissions in the last week. It's actually really hard to comprehend that 30 per cent of the overall positive test cases from March have been in the past week. That is getting out of control. Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker, there is an obligation upon me to share my concerns with this Assembly in relation to the escalation and spread of the virus in Derry. Astonishingly, in the space of a few months, Derry went from having the lowest rate of infection across the whole of the UK to the very highest rate in the whole of the UK. In the space of six weeks, that infection rate rose a hundredfold. The rest of the North and the rest of Ireland, and indeed the rest of the UK, needs to understand what happened in Derry to avoid them having the same disaster that we are experiencing. That would be much, much easier if we had an effective test and trace system, but we don't. But we do know some things. There were house parties, there were dinner parties, birthday parties, First Holy Communions, where hosts and visitors were complacent. There was a fun fair approved by the Executive Office despite concerns of Derry City and Straban Council. And large numbers of those attending, and there were large numbers attending, did not socially distance themselves and did not wear masks. And then, and this is barely believable, we had a well attended anti mask rally last month. Inevitably, there was little or no social distancing. And this is where it really does become unbelievable. One of the speakers was a GP. She is also a political representative, an elected councillor. She's a qualified doctor. She spoke about against wearing masks and also spoke against vaccinations. This level of irresponsibility must be condemned. It must have played a part in the spread of the virus, but how big a part is, we, we cannot tell. As a result of the spread of the virus, it, there is potential for thousands of jobs at risk in the city and district. Hospitality businesses are at risk of collapse. Households will have difficulty in paying their bills. The businesses and their workers desperately need our support, our financial support. Firms in Derry and Straban need to be covered by the extended furlough, and ministers in the executive must stress this to the British government. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, my final words are these. Beware of the conspiracy theorists, the deniers, the fantasists who are putting so very many lives at risk, whose words will inspire people into their hospital beds and perhaps for a few into their graves. There are very few more dangerous things than politicians who ignore evidence, to choose to believe what they want to believe and pretend that that is the truth. If they also happen to be doctors, this is just dangerous. Thank you. I call Mr. Allen Chambers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. 
Uh, I certainly recognise and support the need for this motion today and for those that will surely follow in the days and weeks and indeed even the months uh, ahead. It is disappointing to hear leaks that can only have come from within the executive, been circulated in the public domain and debated on radio. To date, the approach of the executive to the COVID pandemic has been an admirable collective one. There should never be a point when political point scoring should interfere with the responsibility of the executive to protect the life and health of our citizens and to sustain our National Health Service. The staff within our health service at every level have in recent months went far beyond what we should expect from them. They've toiled long hours and have taken threats to their own health and safety head on. The leadership and support they have received from the Health Minister has been rock solid. For it to have been otherwise would have been to risk a collapse in staff morale and commitment. This leadership and support has been publicly supported by the Executive every step of the way. Any corrects in that collective leadership will have bad consequences. It is the last thing we need as we find ourselves being hit with increasing infection rates and rising hospital admissions. Most worrying is the number of people currently needing the intervention of ICU teams. If these figures continue to grow at the current rates, we will, as a society, we could be in really deep trouble. Many people will die. The measures needed to curtail this happening lie in our own hands. The executive must be prepared to take whatever action is needed to minimise the impact of this dreadful virus on our population. If ever there was a vital moment when collective responsibility trumps everything, it's now. I heard this morning some politicians asking the question why their area should suffer intensified restrictions when their rates of infection are much lower than other areas. In my own area of North Down, the figures of infection are low. However, Northern Ireland is too small to start finger pointing across constituency lines. Every day I see convoys of vehicles leaving Bangor with workers bound for Belfast and other places, and later in the day the reverse happens as they return home. It is impossible to guarantee the virus is not making that same journey along the A2 road. That situation is replicated every day in every corner of Northern Ireland. Also recently I've heard many members uh, calling for evidence, more evidence and more data uh, to support the actions that the Health Minister and by extension the Executive are taking. And from my perspective, the evidence that I see and the evidence that convinces me that there is an issue and there is an issue that needs addressed is the number of people who have passed because of this virus and the number of people who have become infected and who will endure a long and difficult recovery. What more evidence do any of us really need? I've also heard people put forward the argument about herd immunity. And they're talking about, uh, well, sure, if everybody catches it, well, that, that will we'll be fine. I would ask those same people who are making those arguments, what is their evidence that if someone catches it, that they will become, as they recover, they will become immune and that they'll not have a recurrence or indeed that they'll not subsequently pass it on to other people? So evidence from those people would be maybe useful as well. Can I just maybe ask uh, the minister that could he confirm um, that every minute of every day is vital as we fight against this virus? And can he confirm that delay in taking decisive action could cause more misery 
and more death. And could the minister also confirm the doubling time? He talked about the doubling time for COVID hospital admissions. Um, could he maybe elaborate on that? And I understand that the past weekend there was around 140 people uh, admitted to hospital. And could I ask the minister if he could maybe tell us that using that doubling rate, what he would expect the rate of admissions to be to hospitals this coming weekend. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call Ms. Paula Bradshaw. Um, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I'd like to also place on record my condolences to those families bereaved and enduring thanks to our health and social care staff in battling this virus. I rise to support the regulations and do so out of necessity in retrospect. I'm extremely concerned about both the interpretation of the evidence under which they and Amendment 5, which was announced at the same time, were agreed. And I need once again to repeat that there is a commu massive communications failure around the announcement of this amendment. These um, failures, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, need to be addressed urgently. Firstly, with specific reference to Amendment 4, the First Minister uh, said at a news conference on the 21st of September that the spread of the virus was happening in domestic properties and not in other environments. I believe she meant primarily in domestic properties, but this was the clear statement to the public that the evidence from the Department of Health was that private homes were considerably higher at risk than anywhere else. The Deputy First Minister made similar comments in an interview at Stormont the following afternoon. Yet, in fact, these statements jarred somewhat with what the Chief Scientific Advisor had in fact said. He said that spread at the time, which had already begun to rise exponentially in some council areas, was being driven by community transmission. Community transmission essentially by definition means the origin of the transmission cannot be identified. Of the cases identified, it may well be the case that they were in homes where pubs were not yet open after all. But we do not know where many of the infections of unclear origin had taken place. Subsequ subsequently, it was confirmed that a significant share of cluster outbreaks in, are in particular happening in gatherings in the hospitality sector. We also have a problem with our contact tracing identified just a few days ago by the acting chief medical um, officer in the Irish government. Supposedly, we are able to pick up where infections are taking place by working forwards from where the infectious people are at the time others become infected. However, contact tracing in Asia works differently, asking instead where a positive case was at the time of infection, not just at the time of infectiousness. With the sheer scale with which case numbers grew, we need to accept that contact tracing was unable to give us the information about where people were at the point of infection. The Minister himself accepted that the scale of rise in cases, particularly in the Derry and Surabhan City Council, were totally unexpected. If contact tracing was providing us with the evidence we need concerning the nature of infections, such things would not be unexpected. Are we to believe that contact tracing was resourced, unable to cope with something so unexpected and continue to give us the evidence about actual point of infection we needed? The acceptance that most cases arise from community transmission is an acceptance that we do not really know. So I would ask the Minister um, to improve the resourcing of the contact tracing service and urgently to consider amending it to, to include questions that will identify the location where someone was first infected, not just where they became infectious, as in the case of Asia. This will be crucial in the evidence base needed for going forward with any further regulatory amendments. Unfortunately, what we, have, what we can see from, um, from when these regulations were first announced on the 17th of September was that we had missed the main areas where infections were rising. None of the initial postcodes to which the regulations applied was in Derry or Straban or in Newry, Morn and, and Down, despite the fact that those are two of the three worst affected council areas by the rapid rise in cases. The trends were simply missed. What does that tell us about the quality of evidence under which we are operating and developing restrictions? Before I come to um, communications, I would also ask why more attention was not given to the general situation concerning how such regulations would be enforced. 
The requirement for no more than a single household to congregate in a private home was introduced at the same time that students were starting to congregate in our houses of multiple occupation. And I've spoken so many times about this, I'm not going to repeat it, but we do know that there are students who came to the Holy Land in September, went home at the weekend to their weekend jobs in the retail sector, brought the infection back into their communities and the inevitable and the predictable happened. Mr De uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, I need to raise some serious reservations about the communications from the Executive Office and the Department of Health about the regulations as well. Gloomy statements containing neither proposals nor action late on a Friday afternoon do nothing to help guide the population at the time of significant strain. And I think the point that's been raised uh, before as well around the evidence, people are getting tired of the same message over and over again. We need to explain to people why we're introducing it, not just what they need to do. So um, the communication was not helped by the fact that um, on, uh, in September that Amendment 4 and 5 came in pretty much on the same day. It were announced um, and were blatantly contradictory. We were led to believe that this, um, this was because domestic transmission was the driver, so restrictions were required in private homes, but not in public venues. But when we asked to see the evidence at committee, it never appeared, and it has since become apparent why. It's because there was never such a solid basis for such evidence, and indeed the evidence from elsewhere, as far afield as Melbourne, or as near as home at Newport, was in fact that wet pubs and their equivalent would lead to an obvious rise in increased transmission. We were told that the evidence was nuanced, but really it was quite clear. We should not have been encouraging social mixing in indoor public venues at exactly the same time as discouraging it in, in, in indoor private homes. Either we encourage social mixing, or we discourage it. Um, just moving on, um, uh, as I just said there, what we have to do is clarify the why. Uh, people need to know if we are going to bring forward any for further restrictions, what, what they need to avoid, because we have to rely on people doing what they think is right in their communities and for their families. So we need to get more buy-in from people. So just in closing, um, Principal Deputy Speaker, there's a lot of justified concern out there among the public. Many cannot face the prospect of further lockdown, while others still feel insecure just leaving things as they are. It is time we start improving our evidence, improving our communications and getting the basic things right. The Chief Medical Officer has been clear that social mixing is the problem. So let us start with proposals from the Health Minister and the Executive for, star for targeted interventions there. Thank you. Mr Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. I um, intend to be short. Um, um, I'm coming more and more concerned about lots of issues, and I'm sure the Health Minister is as well, but I'm, I'm becoming more and more concerned at the lack of time we're having to consider these restrictions. And while I understand the need to adapt to ever changing circumstances with the coronavirus pandemic, the lack of being able to scrutinise properly is becoming a worry for me because the changing scene is, is, happening, is happening at such a, a rapid pace. We're nearly changing things every several days, and I, I do understand the need for that, but it, but it is a worry for me as well, because what we do and what we accept will have a huge impact on the population of Northern Ireland. I worry about the impact we're having on our economy and any potential shutdown, and it was deeply worrying and annoying to hear on The Nolan Show this morning um, about, about that, the way it was done. Um, and, you know, I think something like that should be at the executive. It should be going to the health committee to even discuss and let us hear the reasoning why. And it's just caused absolute havoc out there, people, people listening to that, because we're, they're just not ready for that. And, Mr. Speaker, um, I also um, hear different uh, ways people are, are handling the virus in different countries. And um, Mr. Alistair mentioned it last week um, about the Sweden model. And, and Mr. Chambers has, has just mentioned about herd immunity, and I'm sure it's the, the same topic. But um, it's something, are, are we looking at that? Is, is the chief medical officer looking at that? Um, it, it's certainly something that seems to be becoming more prevalent in the news. And um, I would like to know more about it. I'm not a medical expert, but I would like for us to know more about it. Um, I'm becoming more worried as more cases are being reported, but 
Um, these cases are being picked up in testing, which is good, but our testing, are we now getting to a capacity issue with our testing? And I was, I was hoping the minister could maybe give me an update on whether we are still able to increase that capacity. Um, also, we look down at, I, I call them the mini lockdowns in London, Derry, Straban. Um, I'm wondering, have those mini lockdowns or semi lockdowns, as you call them, are they actually having an effect on reducing the numbers in those areas? Um, these are things that I really want to know about. Um, I'm also worried about our capacity to, to handle the increase in the coronavirus. Um, we've hundreds of nurse vacancies across Northern Ireland, and there, there's even some GP vacancies and stuff. So are we actually in a place to be able to handle um, the increase in this, this surge and the capacity issues? So um, hopefully the Minister can give me some updates on those issues, but I have to say I'm becoming increasingly more and more worried. I'm becoming more and more worried, Mr Speaker, on uh, the issue of mental health and the increase in suicides, because what we are doing is, is putting an effect on people's lives as well. So um, I look forward to hearing more from the Minister, if he could possibly help. Thank you. Mr Pat Sheehan. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for coming in here this morning. Uh, and I rise to support uh, these regulations here today. It's not totally unqualified support uh, in any of these corona coronavirus regulations under normal circumstances. We wouldn't support them, but given the situation we're in, uh, they're considered to be necessary under the circumstances. Um, it has already been mentioned that the uh, issue of process in terms of the uh, Health Committee's scrutiny role in regard to these regulations uh, has come under some criticism recently. and. Uh, there was an issue at the Health Committee last week when the uh, scientific advisor, chief scientific advisor, was giving evidence. And he was asked about providing the committee with the evidence as to the evidence to support the introduction of these regulations. And he said that uh, the SAGE website was open to the public and uh, we could go there if we wanted, uh, but there were thousands of pages. And to me, it wasn't even so much what he said. Uh, it was the way that he said it. And he was given the appearance of being reluctant to provide the committee with the evidence it needs to carry out its statutory role of uh, scrutinizing legislation. So. In terms of the process that the committee uh, is engaged in and what it needs to carry out its statutory role, there certainly uh, the, the, the attitude of the chief scientific advisor last week, in my view, left a lot to be desired. And if the committee can't be given the evidence that's being used to underpin the introduction of these regulations, then it can't do its job properly. I, I understand, and we all understand, we're in a very difficult situation, and particularly now with the rising number of infections. Uh, and, and, and add to that, we have uh, seemed to be, seems to be anyway, a rising number of pandemic uh, deniers, uh, and uh, you know we have these anti-mask demonstrations, conspiracy theorists, and. Uh, every crackpot you can think of com coming out uh, and, and, and making sure their voices are heard. Now, we don't know how strong that view is out there, but there does appear to be certainly cracks appearing uh, in society in regard to the approach towards this virus. Uh, and that may be because there, despite the raising numbers of infections, it appears that there are fewer people actually dying as a result. And that can be explained in a number of ways. First of all, you know, we're nine or 10 months into this pandemic now. We have more knowledge than we did at the start. 
there are treatments available now that weren't available when this pandemic first hit us, uh, and better, better treatments, better drugs, and so on. Uh, and it also appears that uh, the infections at the minute are disproportionately affecting younger people who are healthier and less likely to succumb to uh, serious uh, illness as a result of this. So it, it, it may well be that there's less fear out there in the community, but what we also have to take account of is that the, the numbers have risen very, very quickly. And in terms of hospital admissions, serious illness and potential deaths could be facing us in uh, a week, two weeks or three weeks down the road. And it's important that the executive gets that message out. And I would agree with the, the issue Paula was raising around contact tracing. Uh, I mean, we've had, we've had six or seven months to get the contact tracing sorted out. I spoke here a couple of weeks ago about uh, the difficulties that I personally had. We had a situation not long after that across the water where 16,000 people weren't contact traced as a result of uh, some glitch in the technology. Uh, and the, the difficulties here have been well documented also. So I'm concerned uh, I, I know at the start when the contact tracing operation was re-established that there were only around 100 people involved in contact tracing. And I know you told us recently that there were uh, adverts out uh, for recruitment for other uh, people to join that team. I'm not sure there were very significant numbers. I think it was 20 or maybe 40. Uh, and if, if we're getting you know, a thousand cases a day, I think it won't be long before that contact tracing operation is completely overwhelmed. So uh, we, we need to take account of that. And in terms of, it's, it's not just about testing and tracing, it's also about isolating uh, and supporting those who are isolated. And I know of cases where people have tested positive and didn't isolate. They just went about their business. And some of them, because they were in low paid work and they couldn't afford to isolate for a fortnight, and they went on in the work. And that's, uh, you know, when we're talking about supporting those who have to isolate, we're talking about ensuring that there's financial support there. Now, we know there was, there's, there's a 500 pound payment agreed for across the water. Uh, people will get that but it hasn't been introduced here as far as I'm aware, and that's something that the executive should maybe focus on. And just finally, uh, a few last John Corla, that uh, we live on a small island here, and irrespective of where we come from politically in regard to that and the partition of this island, uh, if we don't operate collectively and, and collaborate together right across this island, it really doesn't matter what we do on either side of the border, whether we put the best system in place that's possible. If the other side of the border isn't doing the same thing, it's going to be the weak link in the chain uh, all the time. So I would uh, implore the minister to take account of the fact that uh, this island should be treated as one epidemiological unit and that any restrictions that are coming in uh, any restrictions anywhere on the island, there should be discussions beforehand between the relevant uh, CMOs and health ministers. Um, so we're in a, we're, we're, we're in a difficult situation. Um, the minister's in a difficult position himself. And there are, there are issues around capacity in our health and social care system. Questions have been raised about what preparations there have been over the past six or seven months because we've all been aware we were waiting on a second surge coming. And it would be interesting to hear what extra precautions and what extra capacity has been built into the system to ensure that we can deal with that. I call Mr. Gary Middleton.
Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And uh, I welcome the opportunity to be able to say a few words uh, on this, following on from my health committee colleagues. Um, first and foremost, I just want to pass on my condolences uh, and thoughts and prayers to the families of the bereaved, um, those who are currently in hospital or unwell with uh, COVID. Uh, I think it's important that we continue to remember those people uh, as they go through uh, their current uh, health situation. I also want to pay tribute to our NHS staff and all of our carers uh, out in the community. I indeed also want to put on record my thanks to the Health Minister for the role that he has played and indeed the Health Committee uh, for their scrutiny role. And I, I think that uh, we, we've seen the benefits of that over this past couple of months. Uh, the regulations themselves are welcome, whilst we may not have wanted to see them, uh, they were needed and I think that that's something which will no doubt um, pay dividends going forward. We know that the regulations themselves obviously have consequences and impacts beyond uh, the health sector. Ultimately, it's about saving lives, but we must try and ensure that we balance uh, the situation between lives and livelihoods as well. I have consistently said that we will not get out of this pandemic through regulations or restrictions alone. There's going to have to be personal responsibility. No matter what we say uh, here in this assembly, whilst we need to show leadership, we also need uh, our communities and those, our neighbours, to ensure that they follow uh, the guidelines that are put in place and they do so in a way that uh, keeps themselves and others safe. We also need a joint up approach. I, I think that what we have seen uh, in recent weeks is the executive uh, pulling together and trying to send out a joint message. But we also need uh, those in our local councils to ensure that that is implemented right through at all levels. And I do want to put on uh, the record my appreciation for my own council, the Darius uh, Council, uh, for the work that they have done. Uh, and we talk about even that cross-border working. You know, I was on a call last week with Donegal County Council and our own council together. And I think that that type of initiative is welcome because you know, this is not about an orange and green or a north-south issue or an east-west issue. I think that uh, if we can try and drive down the number of cases, then we need to do what we can to ensure that that's the case. Uh, my own council as well has shown initiatives around the events and future planning, ensuring that we get in there at an early stage, and I think that, that is very, uh, very important. Now, the, the member for Foyle, my colleague, Shania McLaughlin, did touch on uh, you know, some of the, the things that have happened at a local level, uh, which have been unfortunate. Uh, however, <laughs> without maybe politically point scoring, uh, the member may not be aware that in terms of the fun fair, her own colleague, a member of this chamber, attended the fun fair on a number of occasions. Uh, so it is important that we all uh, take personal responsibility and ensure that when we're throwing stones uh, that we're not doing so in glass houses. There's no blueprint in relation to all of this stuff. <laughs> we're, we're, we're all going through this at a time where uh, we're trying our best and I think that we need to give people the space uh, to allow them to do that. As we look at further new potential restrictions, I would urge the, the health minister and urge all ministers and the executive to look at the wider impacts to look at the impact that it's going to have on our economy, uh, look at the impact it could have on, on, on joblessness and, and, and employment, but also in terms of the mental health uh, impact as well. And I think that all ministers will look at that, but ultimately we need to do what we need to do to ensure that lives are saved and, they're, and that they're protected as well. Uh, just finally, uh, as we go forward, obviously th there's a lot of uh, speculation out there around um, potential restrictions coming forward. The one plea that I would have is around the issue of clarity. Uh, I think that w when it, uh, members have touched on the communication issue, I think we need to be uh, clearly articulating what it is uh, that we're looking at. There should be no, we need to try and eradicate any grey areas because uh, as we've seen uh, with some of the localised restrictions in the past, uh, there have been more questions than answers in terms of what, what, what do we do, where do we shut down, uh, are we able to open. If we can get as much clarity as possible, if we bring people with us uh, on these issues, I think that we'll get out of it much quicker. But just finally, I would urge everyone to uh, follow all of the guidelines, continue to uh, wash your hands, keep a distance, wear a mask where appropriate. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call Ms Orlea Flynn. Gormiel, good to ask and call you. And I would just like to start off also by... Um, recognising the, the pain that's out there amongst all those families that have 
sadly lost someone um, to COVID-19. Um, it is a really worrying and anxious time that we're, we're still in, and I know that mem many members of the public um, are deeply concerned about the rise in numbers that we're, we're seeing um, within the new cases, and also the increased numbers that we're starting to see within um, hospital admissions. Um, the regulations that we're discussing today in particular have obviously came before the Health Committee um, previously, and I know that some of the other members have already spoke about some of the concerns um, around that process um, and power that obviously it grants with the, the Minister and his officials to make some of these, these difficult decisions. So I'll not go over all of that um, in, in detail as some of it's been covered, but I would just like to ask the Minister if he can endeavour to ensure that the Health Committee um, is supplied with as much information um, as possible and as it's being requested to try and help make some of these necessary changes going forward. It's in everyone's interest that full scrutiny um, can occur and it's important that we have the full range of evidence to highlight when actions don't go far enough um, or uh, when they're not proportional. I also want to acknowledge that we are dealing with the regulations after they have already come into play and potentially um, over the next few days and weeks we could be talking about other decisions that, that need to be made. And I know that some members have already quoted some statistics, but I do want to just note how much the situation has changed in the context of the date whenever these regulations were made, which was on the 16th of September. So on the 16th of September, there were 129 new cases, and yesterday there were 1,066. In the week running up to the 16th of September, um, it's been spoke about already, Antrim and Newton Abbey had the highest rate of new cases per 100,000 at just over 50 per 100,000. Yesterday, the rate for Derry and Straban was 946,000, sorry, 946 per 100,000. On the 16th of September, there were 21 hospital cases and three people with COVID-19 were in ICU. And as of yesterday, there were 137 hospital cases of COVID-19 with 19 people in ICU. So it's alarming and it's a stark warning at how this virus can and is spreading, even with some restrictions already in place. And restrictions aren't the only answer to fighting COVID-19. It's also the investment in public health services, such as the testing and contact tracing programmes and supporting those who need to be self-isolating and staying at home. We're definitely not in a good place and particularly um, we're seeing the high rates around the border areas also, which is highlighting the reality that the virus is spreading from community to community. And as already, uh, has already been said, we do need to have that coordinated um, approach. And unlike the first wave, we're now heading into the winter months when we know that the Health and Social Care Service um, is going to be under significant strain and struggling to cope. So many operations and appointments um, are cancelled or are being missed, and this is storing up problems for the future. But the answer must include the central aim of suppressing the spread of COVID-19. Clearly, further action does need to be taken uh, but that also means that action from government and its agencies will provide support in having the appropriate systems in place that we need to help fight the spread of coronavirus. Graham Yogurt. Mr. Daniel McCrossan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. And uh, I rise as well to support uh, what I would consider to be necessary regulations and changes to them. Uh, Minister, I'd also like to pay tribute to you. Uh, this is a very uh, challenging and difficult time, and I certainly don't envy the position that you're in or the very difficult and delicate decisions that you must consider and reach on a daily basis in relation to this very fluid uh, situation. I'd also like to offer my condolences to the many families uh, of the bereaved. To lose anyone at any time to whatever illness uh, is a very difficult Thing. To lose them to this uh, virus, uh, which may have been picked up uh, quite easily uh, by someone who visited, uh, is totally mind-boggling and uh, 
beyond words or comprehension, particularly when it could have been potentially avoided. And that's really what we need to get out there to people. This virus does ch transmit so easily. We don't, some people don't even know they have it. And because they're not taking the necessary precautions, they may put others at risk, maybe within their own family or maybe in the community. I'd also like to pay tribute to our frontline workers and our key workers who continue to provide a vital ser service to our public, a life-saving service uh, to those in need. This has been a very difficult time. It's been a difficult year. There are businesses that are now closed almost eight months. Our society has been forever changed. Our lives have been impacted in every single way that you could possibly imagine by this virus. And it is difficult. It is difficult for everyone. It is difficult for all of our people. And it is certainly impacting on the mental health of our uh, general population. I, I was in isolation for two weeks. And I, I can tell you, as a young person, yes, I had symptoms of the virus. And it impacted me for a period within those two weeks of five days quite badly, and then eased beyond that. But I can also say that a very difficult part of that isolation was being at home for two full weeks without getting out. And it's very tough, and I'm a young person, so I can only imagine the impact that has on people who have been at home for months, who have made considerable sacrifices, who are lonely, living alone, and very severely impacted, who are so worried about getting this virus uh, that they're doing everything possible to avoid it, and often to their own detriment in terms of their own physical and mental health as well, because have no doubt about it, it is having an impact uh, on the health and well-being of our uh, population. Uh, and that's where we need to get the, the balance, or the delicate balance, very, very right. There are other people in our society as well, Minister, uh, that are struggling with other illnesses, life-threatening illnesses, who are concerned that when this second wave has come, and it has arrived now, uh, that their treatments may be affected or cancelled. They need reassurance. They need to be told that they will still be a priority, that cancer patients in particular and others will not be forgotten about, that, that they won't come second to this virus, because that is what has been spilled throughout pages of social media day and daily. And there needs to be a solid message from this House and from the Department and the Minister that we will not forget those who are in those very difficult and challenging circumstances. And we should also continue to encourage those who are in those circumstances to continue to present to uh, their doctor, GP or the health service generally, should they need it, that it is there for them. I also must point out that this is a very, very delicate situation. It's a delicate situation between protecting lives, protecting jobs and our livelihoods. And with that comes great pressure, immense pressure on our society, on our people, on our business owners. You know, asking a business to shut for eight months, almost in some instances, is a very stressful situation for the person that has a mortgage to pay, has a family to feed. That has an impact on the mental health of that individual as well. And that is why we must get this right at every level. We haven't got an endless pot of money. Everyone knows that. But intervention for those in need at that time is absolutely critical, particularly in ensuring that they buy in to doing whatever they can uh, to play their part. But if someone's reached uh, in a situation, a decision between feeding their family and keeping their business shut, it's a very, very difficult place. And that's why the intervention from this House and from Westminster for businesses needs to be meaningful and it needs to be sufficient. And no direct criticism of, 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 of the Minister, but the current, although we, I understand he's restricted, the current intervention is not sufficient. And I've heard that, and I'm sure his own party and others around this chamber have heard the same. The key to this, and I've heard it from other members speaking, communication is absolutely vital. And there is, as Mr. Middleton rightly points out, there's no blueprint to this. We don't have a book we can refer to with all the answers in it. This situation is very fluid. We're learning about this virus. It is new. And we're learning about how it affects each of us and how we can live with it and move around it where possible. But 
It is vitally important in doing that that we have confidence in the message. And I know the Health Minister has continued uh, to reiterate the message, as has others. But there needs to be confidence in the public message from this House. It needs to be united, yes, as a five-party executive, but we need to collectively pull together to ensure that we're all on the one page. That's difficult because we're political parties with different views, with different opinions on how things happen. But one thing we cannot toy with or play with is the, the clear guidance around how we protect each other and ourselves. So therefore, there is a job of work to be done in rebuilding confidence in that message. And we, as Assembly members, all have a part to play in doing that. Because the public are leaving us. They are ahead of us on a lot of things, but they're starting to ask serious questions. And they're entitled to do that. Their lives are impacted. They're entitled to ask the questions. They're not entitled to mislead. They're not entitled to go on to Facebook and state uh, uh, things as fact when they're completely and absolutely untrue, because that, again, puts others at risk. But we here have a job of work in challenging the false narrative and presenting the truth as we go forward, as we learn. And how we do that is by having a clear and transparent message. And we can talk about the level of infection, and we can talk about the level of death, but this has been around now for eight or nine months. And people are frustrated, they're concerned, they're worried, they're fed up. We also should be telling publicly the level of recovery to reassure people that you're not, you know, you could die from this, yes, but people recover and recover well. Because there is a huge amount of concern and anxiety that we need to also ensure that we provide the, the clearest possible information to challenge. And that's why we need to come back to the fundamentals of this. Should we be providing the numbers of infected? Yes. Should we be providing the numbers of people who have sadly died from this? Absolutely. But we should also be providing information, transparent information around the numbers of people that have recovered and recovered well, and what the impact was, because there are so many cases I know it's difficult, but we need to provide that in a public domain as well. And also in relation to the virus, what do we know about the virus? Because if we're shutting businesses and people's lives are affected, we need to provide the clearest possible information about the virus. What have we learned? Are we dealing with a lesser strain? Are we dealing with a virus that has weakened? Because we're not seeing, maybe, the level of death. Because I remember, like other members in this House, watching the TV and seeing Italy and seeing body bags on hospital floors and seeing them in trucks and get, seeing them buried. And that scared the life out of me and many others. And luckily, we, we aren't at that place. And I hope, sincerely, we never are. But we need to be very clear about what we're dealing with so the public have confidence in the message. And also around testing, because there has been concerns raised around testing. Have we sufficient capacity to test people? And are tests accurate? Because I am fed up listening to that question. And I know the Minister, thankfully, has committed to providing that public reassurance, because, again, it is about transparency. It is important that we provide as much information to the public domain as we can to build the confidence in that message. And that is why some decisions taken during this pandemic may be questioned. And that is why some of the situations we found ourselves in over the course of the last few weeks may have conflicted with the message that we have been sharing from this House. Keep two metres apart. But many, even teachers, principals, are saying to me, but Mr McCrossan, why are 30 children allowed to go into a classroom and go home to their grandparents and their parents and spread it? And yes, it's a delicate situation. It's very important we educate our young people and our children. But it conflicted exactly with the message of keeping two metres apart. And the public raised questions. Also, in terms of conflicting messages, eat out to help out. Great scheme, supported business, absolutely. But was the timing right? Is this not something that would have been better in January or February? Did this spread the virus? Did it contribute? Well, when you consider the 64 million people across the UK availed of that scheme, you would suggest that yes, it definitely played its part. And again, I understand there's no blueprint, but we have to get this right, and the message needs to be clear. We need to protect jobs. We need to protect livelihoods for the exact reason, as I've said. As much as people are worried about this virus and doing their part in closing the businesses and adapting their lives, they need support 
and if they haven't got this support, their mental health will be affected, again adding pressure to our already crippled health service. It's very important that at all times we are consistent in what we're asking the public to do, because they will leave us. They will go ahead and raise questions, and social media, as we've seen, can take legs of its own, and people believe false narratives as fact, and we have a great job in trying to challenge that. Every day of the last month, I am challenged on the message, as I'm sure other members are, but I am true to that message in ensuring that we at all times must ask people to play their part to keep each other safe. The other point that was raised by Ms Bradley, Bradshaw, sorry, Bradshaw, Bradley, Bradshaw was in relation to uh, the First Minister, uh, uh, who in a press statement said that the transmission was largely down to house parties and social gatherings in houses, and I have no doubt they played their part, because it's not, it, it, we are human beings, we naturally come together, challenging, eight months apart, but house parties have certainly, in my view and others, have played a massive role in this. And I said to the Deputy First Minister last week that it is my firm view, particularly with particularly with the closures of pubs and restaurants and cafes, there's still going to be an element of our community that are going to have social gatherings in their homes because they can quite easily access alcohol from off licenses. And I asked why we haven't closed off licenses. When there's nowhere to go, not singling out young people, but they will gather together in some spot and it's difficult to police that we won't even know what's happening, and that's where this thing potentially will transmit. I've had parents on the phone to me, uh, Mr. Prince and Deputy Speaker, crying because they have a, a son or a daughter, 19 or 20 years of age, who won't stay in the house, who are going out with friends. And that parent is saying, what, what am I to do? Lock them in the room? Put them out of the house? These are parents that are vulnerable and, and at risk. And you, they just can't get the message through to those young people who think this is, that they're invincible to this and that they won't spread it. And that's what's so scary about this, because people that have had it, as the health minister will know, some don't even produce any symptoms. And that's the worry in relation to this. So I would ask that the health minister apply any pressure to ensure that off licences are, are, are dealt with, because a lot of people are asking questions as well in relation to that and that he would do whatever he can to ensure that those who are making the necessary sacrifice to save lives, and we're all making sacrifices, necessary sacrifice to save lives, have the intervention necessary to support them in their closure, because it's so critical. And I'll finish on this other point. We do need to collectively work together. We all know, regardless of our political differences, that this virus knows no border. It transmits with people. And earlier this week, I don't live very far from the border, about three minutes' walk, I sat at the tennis, the famous tennis, and I watched the free flow of traffic on both sides of that border. Huge volumes. Going to shop, essential journeys in some instances, given that there are a lot of rural people live on both sides. But there didn't seem to be the intervention from this House, the regulations of this House, didn't seem to take the effect that I thought that it would. And that concerns me, because things just seem to be as normal. And when you're trying to explain, is it a lockdown? Is it restrictions? What is it? It's very difficult. And that's why the message needs to be clear. And as Mr. Sheehan sa said, and, and, and rightly so, we need to work right across these islands. We are one island. And we need to work with the Irish government, as I know the Health Minister and others have, have done, to ensure that we have the strongest possible approach in protecting human life and the livelihoods of our society. We all have a part to play, and that is not just in spreading the message and getting the message out there and ensuring that it's clear, but it also in challenging the false narrative that is getting the attention of a lot of people. And the only way we can challenge that is by a clear, consistent messaging 
and with the facts and evidence to support those facts. Thank you, Mr. Pencil, Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call Ms. Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I didn't expect to be called, but I appreciate the opportunity because I too would like to go on record to offer my condolences to all those people who have lost lives through this uh, pandemic. I also want to thank the Minister and all his colleagues who were faced hourly with the changing situation and the difficulties that that arises. But I've listened carefully to the commentary in the House and there is much speculation, even amongst ourselves here, about the age profile of those who are currently amongst the numbers which are growing rapidly at a frightening and alarming rate. But I am fearful that there is this growing narrative that it is young people who are ultimately the lawbreakers or the rule breakers. And I know from my own outings, which I restrict at every opportunity, I see on many occasions people who do not fit that age profile, who are equally as complacent. And it may well be that those people or individuals have exemptions to our masks. It may well be that those people don't feel that they fit in any profile which would endanger them specifically. But if that's the case, if it is the latter, what a selfish act, what a very selfish thing to do, to go about your business feeling somehow immune to this virus and feeling no sense of responsibility to those around you and the vulnerable people around you. So I do join with others in putting that message out. And it's good to hear the unison in this House that those people who take with um, anonymous accounts, and not even anonymous accounts, I have to say, in this instance, to spread absolute rubbish with no foundation to suggest that there is anything other than facts behind the decisions that are made. And I listened to my colleague, Mr. McCrossan, asking for clarity and that somehow the messaging will be contradictory, but it will. The messaging will be contradictory at times because this isn't an absolute. This is a balancing act. Of course, we want our children to go to school. Of course, we want life to resume as we all know it, but we can't have it that way. And what we're all charged with doing is finding out how much can we get away with without taking that level of risk home to the people who will be most affected. So I don't come here expecting absolute clarity and to follow a logic through all the decisions. It won't be there because there is no absolute answer. And we all have, no doubt, different perspectives. We all come at it with different priorities about what is important in our lives. And that may come from your age profile, from where you live. And everybody will, no doubt, have different solutions. But I do think we have to do our very best to reach out to everybody. We have to follow through with, if we ask somebody to isolate, that we know in our heart of hearts that they can do that because they have the financial power behind them to do it, should that be the, the amount that we, we heard mentioned that needs to be announced of £500 for people here. We also need to know that we can empower people to, to know that there are support mechanisms out there, that when they have to go into isolation or into lockdown, that they will have access to food, uh, medicines, and all of that support around them. And the mental health and loneliness issues are recognised, and that we do empower communities to support each other. Again, as I say, uh, Mr. Spe Principal Deputy Speaker, I didn't expect to be called, but I do welcome the opportunity and I do support the regulations here in front of us. And I recognise that more may need to be done. And I think everybody in this House has a duty to stand up in one voice and explain to the public why they, like us, have as much a role to play in this as we do. Thank you. I call Mr Jim Allister. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I'll make a few comments in a moment about the pros and cons of various issues, but I want to pick up on um, what the Chair of the Health Committee had to say in his opening remarks, because he rightfully, I believe, I'm not a member of the Health Committee, but taking at face value what we were told, he rightfully made a criticism that if the Committee is not being provided the data 
uh, justifying these regulations, then that is a very poor situation because you cannot scrutinise without knowing the facts relating to that which you are scrutinising. Uh, and that is, I think, a very uh, valid contention. Secondly, he said that uh, there was concern in the committee about the lack of order oversight to any uh, future additions and changes to these regulations. And I must say, I do strongly share that because when you go to this particular regulation uh, and go in particular go especially to Schedule 2 of the regulation. We read a couple of things that I find surprising. We find in Schedule 2, paragraph 1, subparagraph 2, that a direction ending the emergency period may be revoked at any time by the Minister of Health. Fair enough, you might say. That's after consulting the experts. But let's think about that. That's talking about where the emergency has been revoked. The health minister, and only the health minister, with no need to consult anyone other than the chief medical officer and the chief scientific officer, can then make a direction revoking the ending of the emergency period. It's there in black and white. The effect of such revocation is that the emergency period then immediately recommences. So at the stroke of a pen, the health minister and the health minister alone can decide to reinstate the emergency. Now, that does rather drive a coach and horses through the idea of anyone, never mind a scrutiny committee, uh, having any say, even an executive having any say, if it means what the plain words seem to mean, that any revocation of the emergency uh, can be done by the import of paragraph 1.4 of the schedule, namely that the direction is made by being published online and, as much, and must, as soon as reasonably practical after it is made, be published in the Belfast Gazette. So by publishing online a revocation of the emergency and by having it published in the Belfast Gazette, the emergency can be reinstated. That does not seem to me to be an adequate course embracing the basic concepts of consultation. Uh, and that's quite an, in addition to the point that the chair made about you can add, take, take away from or add to uh, the various uh, postcodes, etc simply by making a direction. You can do much more than that. Under this regulation, we are giving power to the minister to reinstate an emergency that has been revoked by simply decreeing such. I'm not sure that's that healthy a situation. It's not that I don't trust the health minister. The health minister in this house has, I think, the most difficult job in government. I think any of us would be very foolish to envy him the role that he has. But we are giving him phenomenal power if we are giving him by a mere direction, made in that manner, the right to recommence the emergency. So I do question why that regulation is drafted in such sweeping terms. You know, the emergency periods had to themselves pass through a legislative process here. Now we seem to be adopting a great shortcut in respect of that, which I, for one, am not happy about.
But I'll then move on to some of the other points the Chair mentioned. The lack of data backing up some of these. I think that is a real concern. But if we listen to the media today, that's a concern not just in the committee. According to some anonymous source from the executive, that's a concern in the executive. Really? That this executive is not, according to that source, being given the data that would justify decisions such as the reported call from the chief medical officer for a six-week lockdown. I'm staggered if that is so. That data as basic, as far-reaching, as essential as that, if that is correct, if that is correct, if that has not been given to the executive, then that is beyond appalling to think that the executive could be asked to impose a six-week lockdown without executive ministers having the basic data. I think we need urgently clarity on the veracity of that claim. And if it's not true, then it needs to be rectified. And if it is true, the circumstances that give rise to it need to be rectified. Because either way, it cannot be right. Yes? We're giving way. And uh, in the commentary around data, um, obviously that can pertain to health data. But would the member agree with me that in considering any potential restrictions that would infringe on schools, uh, for example, that we need to look at the impact that that had on the closure of schools? One school that I'm very familiar with in my own constituency, a third of children engaged in online learning, zero, a third. There was no interaction at all. And the impact that's having now on the school is phenomenal. And therefore, going forward, we need to be looking at what was the impact on children's education from previous lockdowns, the impact on our economy, employment, as well as the health data, which would be important to inform people when it comes to taking these decisions. I agree absolutely. And in fairness to the health minister, I think he did say in his opening remarks that it was a balance. And of course, it wasn't just about health, although obviously that's his primary discipline and concern. But you're absolutely, the member is absolutely right that a, there has been very considerable, some of it maybe irreparable damage done to some, uh, both in terms of their well-being and in terms of kids. So to think that we would move uh, to a six-week lockdown without the data is, I say, quite staggering. But my fundamental question about moving into lockdowns is, where's the exit strategy? How do you get out of these lockdowns? If every time, as I said last week, there's a rise in the infection rate, you introduce a form of lockdown, and you never build any immunity in the community. A member from North Down doesn't like that idea, uh, but I think most scientific data relating to COVID does seem to agree there is an element, maybe some dispute about how much, there is an element of immunity from those who have it. Uh, but if every time, because the infection rate, not the death rate, because the infection rate rises, you go into a lockdown, when do you ever get out of a lockdown? Because when you come out next time, and the infection rate rises again, because the, the virus is still there, you go into another lockdown. Where is the exit strategy? And it is that ongoing effect that really begins to kill our economy and really puts us in a very, very perilous position. So, yes, it's necessary to have regulation. It's necessary to supervise them. But it's also necessary to think through where's the long-term strategy in all this. I understand entirely 
The first lockdown was premised on a great fear of our health service being overwhelmed. We were told 15,000 people could die. Uh, and we'd seen, as Mr McCrossan, in what was a very balanced and considered speech from the authority of somebody who's had COVID, he referred to the situation in Italy. We all saw that. It was frightening. And no great surprise, therefore, of a fear of our health service being overwhelmed back in March. But can we really say with the same vigour or conviction that that same threat exists today? You know, what is it, 18, 19 people in our ICU, ICU units with COVID? Two deaths, I think, last week. Can we really say that is a justification for a wholesale six weeks or whatever lockdown, that the threat is such to our health service that we must have it? I think when you put all that into the balance of what's going to be the increasing impact on the well-being of our wider community and of our economy, then frankly, the threshold for a lockdown gets higher, not lower. And I fear that we're being maybe just a little too ready to rush to a lockdown with no exit strategy and insufficient thought to what it ultimately does to the whole community. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Alistair. It is now 13.51 hours. I'm assuming the Minister is going to take more than 10 minutes to respond to the points made. Uh, if not, if you wanted to indicate to me if you, you think it will take a bit more than that. That's, that's what I suspected. And I don't think it would be fair either uh, to the Minister to allow him to get sort of nine minutes in and then bring him back after lunch for the remaining three or four minutes. So what I propose to do is the, we shall take our ease until question time. And then they start okay. anyway. And yes, see, that's fine. If you're happy with that, that's fine. I, I, I'm, at the, I'm always at the House's... Call the Minister. I'm always at the, at the House's call, um, and I have been since, since this place came back. Look, I'm, I'm grateful to members for their contributions to this debate. And Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, in my opening comments, I deliberately widened it um, over this regulation that we should be talking about today, because I have been cognizant that when we come in here to, to talk about some of these regulations, it has been a wide-ranging debate. But I think about where we are today, I think it was only just and right that this House had the opportunity to have that wider um, discussion. And I appreciate the degree of goodwill that the Assembly shows towards what is the usual process, whereby the role of the legislative scrutiny is applied only after the event in regards to these specific regulations. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, I believe it is important that scrutiny does take place in order to examine and comment on the measures that have been taken. So in the co current context, things move fast, and the observations and concerns of Assembly members and colleagues are taken on board as we develop policy and work on the next set of amendments. I also believe the public must have confidence that the Executive is not acting without scrutiny. Um, and for that reason, I'm happy to respond to questions and comments raised by members during um, this debate. Um, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, as always, can I thank the Chair and the Health Committee uh, for their scrutiny of the, these regulations. And I think, as Mr. Sheehan has said as well, in normal times, we would not be sorry. The Health Committee would not be doing this. This House would not be accepting them. In normal times, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I would not be bringing them. It's as simple as that, and I've said that on a number of occasions. And, and, but we are not in, in normal times. Um, in regards to that, and I picked up on, on the Chair's comments in the charge of, of this being done, a lot of this being done by, by direction in regards to the departmental analysis that's allowed and, and the timing and the openness that the Committee does get. Some of the struggles and some of the challenges because of these regulations are being brought forward through health. Many of the, the underlying principles are without health, so we had play areas, pubs, licensing, but they do fall to, to the analysis of, of the health, health committee. 
Um, so that's where I endeavour to provide as much support uh, as my department can. Um, and, and I think in regards to the conversation that the, the Health Committee had in, in regards to, to the bubbles, uh, that has been brought back. But I think the, the Chair himself indicated it was the abuse of those bubbles because if somebody was able to turn a bubble on and off in a matter of hours, if not the next day, it starts to undermine the whole principle and uh, the benefit that that bubble actually brings as to how we manage um, the spread of, of, of transmission. Um, in regards to, to where we were, and I think a number of members referred to this when these uh, regulations were actually made, we were in a very, very different place as to where we are today, and I think that's why they have been superseded and, and will be superseded. But when the Chair was speaking then as the health spokesman for, for, for his party, for Sinn Féin, I think one of the things that, that is clear is under the current spread and the current trajectory, I can quite openly and quite honestly, hand on heart, say in our health service is under pressure. I've said it many times in this House uh, recently, that we've been trying to run three health services. Ben Goa made it very clear that we mean, when he brought about his changes long before COVID, that we needed to be running a health service plus a transformation service. When the initial phase, the initial wave of COVID set in, we did transform to a COVID service. And many of our day-to-day our -day services and elective surgeries were challenged and, and were cancelled. We got to a place where we don't want that to happen again, but the trajectory that we are currently in, if we do not have the interventions and have them soon, we will have to revert to a COVID service. For the simple fact, we cannot turn people away at the door of a hospital because they have COVID. When it comes to, to re-establishing the IC unit, ICU unit, uh, that specialty regional approach that we took in the tar block, uh, when we have to do that, for 15 ICU beds, we need 100 nurses. We can only do that by stripping ICU nurses from the, across the entirety of our health service in this province. When we put that number of people into ICU beds, we need anaesthetists from across the province. So when we take anaesthetists out of our health service, no matter where they work, no matter what trust they are, that has an adverse impact on the number of operations that we can actually perform. So when it comes to that question, you know, how much did we do to prepare? How much are we doing? I cannot create nurses. I cannot create anaesthetists in two months, in three months. And when it comes to more beds, beds are a physical thing, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I've said it before in here, and I, I maintain it, and we've all championed them in this House. It's our health service staff that we rely on and their resilience uh, and their flexibility and their adaptability where they actually work across our health service. In the first wave, they've done a fantastic job. And Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I'll come back to the other comments after question time. Thank you. As question time begins at 2 p.m., uh, I suggest that the House takes its ease until then. Um, after question time, this debate will resume when the Minister will conclude his remarks. The members would just take their ease to allow change at the top table. Thank you. Okay, members, we'll uh, resume the sitting, and uh, we were in the midst of the Minister um, winding on the, the motion, if I understand. So, Minister, do you want to continue um, on? Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And just referring now to, to members' comments, and I'll move now to the comments from um, the Vice Chair of the Committee. And I think she rightly points out as, um, as how we have to get ahead of this virus, because the line that has been used many times is this virus does not spread itself, it's our actions that spread it. So every, every recommendation, every step that comes from, from the executive, comes from the Department of Health, is about breaking the, those infection chains. And I think what we've, we've seen and what uh, I think other members have referred to is how, at the point when these regulations come in, it was indicated that the majority of our transmission uh, were indicated from households, and now that has moved to, to community settings. So our reaction has to move with, with the virus. And I, one of the phrases um, that the vice chair of the committee used, and it's something that, that is often said, you know, is we have to learn how to live um, with this virus. We learn to live with this virus by following the guidance and the restrictions that this executive brings in, because that's how we make sure people actually live with this virus and don't die actually from it. Um, so, so the message that, that she relayed 
uh, in regards to, to those spreaders, those people that don't care. You know, that, that stop and wise up message. And, and I thank her for that blunt message because I think it's what is needed to get through to that very, very small minority who either think they're above this virus, immune to it, or just don't care. And that's the bit that actually worries me. Um, her, her specific question is in regards to you know, what have we done or what has the department done, what have the trusts done uh, to prepare for this second surge. And I think you know, she'll recall the, the debate that we actually had last week where I brought forward our winter surge plans and actually paused our rebuilding programme because we had an indication at that stage that we would have to look at those steps that can protect a service that is already fragile. Uh, support a workforce that is already under pressure, uh, but still provide those essential services that we see uh, core to our health service. So those surge plans across trusts show how we can do that, but it's all dependent on how many COVID um, inpatients and ICU patients we actually end up with. So every step that we take that reduces the number of inpatients, reduces the number of ICU patients, means we can do that bit more that is in our surge plan in the normal the normal running of things. I, I, said, I said in this place before that currently, um, when Bungoa started, you know, we, we were asked to run a health service and a transformation service. Recently, we've been running a health service, a transformation and a COVID service. Uh, the more pressure that comes on our general services, the less we can do um, of the first two. Um, Sinead uh, referred to the specifics around uh, Derry City and Straban. Uh, council area and how, how others c could learn from that. And I think, Mr Speaker, one of the things that we did see when the additional restrictions went into Derry City and Strabane Council area, we saw a reaction from elected representative, re representatives in Newry Morning Down and in Mid-Ulster and in other council areas who really stepped up their messaging um, to the general public. But one of the issues that she did, re did raise, and it's again a, a concern of mine, was the anti-mask rally that was held in, in the Guild Hall, where that group spoke, you know, spoke against masks, spoke against vaccines, spoke against regulations. Um, but there's one thing that I think that everyone who attended that rally would have uh, in common with all of us. They expect the health service to be there for them. You know, so why they reel against it, why they attack the regulations, why they attack the guidance that is coming out from our scientific advisors, and being made heartfelt, uh, those heartfelt pleas that are coming from our nurses, our doctors, and anybody that's in the health service asking people to follow those, they still expect those people at the end of the day to be there to make them better should they contact COVID or anything else. In regards to then comments coming from, from Mr Chambers, uh, and he spoke about you know, how we were comparing or how we could compare um, areas across Northern Ireland in regards to that. And one of the things I, I've heard that on, I've heard that on media this morning. What I will say to the member, when we look at where we were on the 27th of September to the present day, so roughly 14 days, um, under the Newton Abbey Council area, uh, positive cases have increased fivefold. Uh, Arden North Down increased fourfold. Uh, Armagh City Banbridge Council area threefold. Belfast fourfold. Causeway Coast and Glen sixfold. Derry and Strabane, fivefold. Fermanagh and Oma, fourfold. Lisburn and Castlereagh, fourfold. Mid Ulster, fourfold. Uh, Newry Morning Down, fourfold. So when people try to say my area isn't as bad as Derry City and Strabane, being the best of a bad lot is not a good place to be. And in fact, you know, when I look, you know, Mid and East Antrim Council area, my, my, part of my own constituency, part of Mr Alistair's constituency as well, is now the lowest. And you know, we look at that and we hold it up and go, Mid and East Antrim is now low. It's at 83.7, uh, according to yesterday's figures. That was when we brought in the initial measures in that Balamina BT43 and Belfast area. So when the, the regulations that we're debating today were actually brought in, Mid and East Antrim was lower than it is today. So it's not... It is that it is in a good place because it's the lowest of, of our council district areas, but it doesn't mean to say that it's doing the best that it can because we've so much to do across the entirety. And I think one of the challenges that we do have when we, when we talk about our council areas and then try to compare them 
uh, to council areas uh, in the Republic of Ireland and England. You know, we're talking about a population of 1.8, 1.9 million, which is actually smaller than Manchester. So when we hear of restrictions being brought in in Manchester, we try to compare that to what has been done in Derry City and Strabane, when the, the scale, the complexity, the number of people involved actually aren't, uh, you know, actually aren't a direct comparison. So it's about how we get our messaging uh, right to re reflect that as well. Um, Mr Chambers also asked um, you know, about time. Time is critical. Every day counts. When we're looking at a doubling, as I said in my opening remarks, when we're looking at a seven-day doubling in our cases, our hospitalisations, and all the other indicators that we're seeing, the positive cases that we're seeing in our over 60s, every day does count as to when we bring in those, those additional uh, steps. Uh, in regards to uh, Ms Bradshaw's comments in regards uh, to executive messaging, um, that came in regards to these regulations uh, back in September. I, I, I hadn't uh, a detailed uh, account of what the First and Deputy First Minister actually said in the, pre in, in the press conference uh, that day, but I'll refer her comments back to, to the Executive Office and EIS to, to see where they, they fall. In regards to your contact tracing system, um, one, of the, one of the most, I suppose, critical points in our contact tracing system is the information that the individuals at contacts actually give to it. Because the more information our contact tracers get from people who have tested positive, the more it helps us shape the data that we have, but also the understanding of where we see the virus going. On Friday, uh, the contact tracing service actually moved um, to an online offering as well. Uh, so when someone receives a, a positive case, they'll receive a text message. They'll also receive a link to a specific website where people can go on, enter their own details, enter their own contacts as well, to try and enhance and speed up uh, that transfer of information as well. So it's about utilising uh, modern technology in the work that we want to do. But one of the things that I, I think makes our, our contact tracing service um, unique in, in comparison to some of the others. It's still something that we hold in-house. It's not a private organisation. It's not a for-profit organisation that's run, it, so it's run within, within the confines of the public health um, agency. Um, Ms Bradshaw also asked when we were bringing these regulations in on the, on the 21st of, of September as to why we didn't include Derry City and Strabane and Newry Moore. And, and the reason was they were in a very, very different place back on the 21st of September. You know, those areas were among the lowest across, across Northern Ireland. Um, so what we did at that point in time was proportionate to where we are. When we moved to increase the regulations to postcodes, it actually covered the entirety um, of Northern Ireland. In regards to Mr Easton's concerns, and I can say to the member that I share his, his concerns and everything that, that he raised from the pace of change from what we've seen in the past seven days, the past 14 days, on the trajectory we're going, and that's why we're saying we need to take um, the interventions that we do. He expressed his annoyance as to, to what was done this morning and the message that, that was put out and how that undermines the general health message. I agree with him. I'm not going to get involved in it um, because I think we still have a piece of work, work to do to try to get that united message from our executive and from this House as to what needs done. Um, in regards to testing, he, he indicated that the concerns of testing. We've continued to access Pillar 2 testing and also enhance our own uh, testing in Pillar 1, uh, where I think in the past couple of days uh, we were actually hitting over 10,000 uh, tests per day. And I think, Mr Deputy Speaker, one of the things that we need to be sure from our public dashboard is the number of tests per day, number of people tested and number of positive tests. There is a specific indicator there of the number of people tested is those who have been tested for the first time. So there is further information in the dashboard that shows if anybody who's had a repeat tests how that the positivity rate actually ties into uh, the percentage of positive tests as to the number of su successfully uh, completed tests. And I think that's a, a piece of information that needs clarified. Um, he asked me one of the most salient questions, and I think as, as Mr Easton has been raising since, since I came into this post and since we were you know, this place was re-established, is do we have enough nurses? And it's something that he has continually asked, should it be from our international nurses, from our recruitment processes? Um, and the answer is no. We didn't have enough nurses um, in March, we didn't have enough nurses in January, and we don't have enough nurses now. 
And the more this virus spreads in the community, the more our health staff, including nurses, are at risk of contacting, no matter you know, the precautions that are there. And, and that's the challenge that we do face when we look to running um, and supporting those patients with COVID, but trying to maintain um, the service that we, need, we know needs to be done. And that's some of the, ch the challenges and the changes, and, and it goes back to Ms. Mrs. Cameron's point, it goes back to Mr. Sheehan's point as well, uh, about the changes that we've made. Uh, in regards to orthopaedics moving to a, a regional service, to the elective surgeries at Lagan Valley, to our cancer reset service, you know, all those parts, all those steps are critical to ensure that we can maintain our service, not the service that I, I would like, it's not the service that I want, but it's so we can maintain our service, while we have to support and help all those people who are coming forward um, with COVID, because there's no body in our health service, there's no point that we can see somebody walk up to a door of a hospital and ask somebody to make that judgment, no, you have COVID, I don't have a bed for you today. Because that's, that's, that, that is what our health service, um, I, I don't expect it to do it. So it's a, the additional pressures that actually come, come, at, that point of, come at that point of challenge. Um, in regards, and, and he's right again in regards to the challenge of, of the statutory role of, of the committee and that, of, of challenging and also of this house. But it also, and I've raised this in the committee and I've raised it here before, and it was addressed when you know, FM and DFM, when the junior ministers came to address some of the regulations as well. These regulations, uh, many of them are, are cross sectional, they cross all departments and they have implement, implement, uh, implications across other, other bodies apart from, my, from mine as well. But as they are health regulations, uh, that's why I'm here today bringing these ones, these ones, these ones forward because they are brought uh, by and for the executive. And the point he made, uh, and it's a valid one because it's a narrative that is out there, and I think it's a narrative that's dangerous. You know, there's more people getting this, but there's not as many people dying. There's not as many people dying now at this point in time. We've always seen that lag from infection to hospitalisation to ICU to death, and that's why we're trying to take the steps now. Uh, to reduce those number of deaths. There are improvements in treatment, there are improvements in knowledge, but the best thing we can do is actually stop people getting this, this virus. And for those who must, and I think Pat rightly challenges is that, that narrative, there's not as many people dying now. I would ask them, I would ask them to come forward and tell me, what is your trigger point? How many people dying per day from COVID is the point that you want us to take action. We just sit back until you come up and say, hey, this is how many people have died. Now you have to do something, Health Minister. That's not how I work. That's not how our health service works. And I sincerely hope it's how nobody in this House thinks we should measure our reaction uh, and the severity and the proportionality uh, to the regulations that, that we do bring in. Um, and, and indeed, so, some of the other points he raises and some of the, the conversations that have been had around the executive table. And that's the encouragement for those who are contacted by our, our test and trace procedure to, to self-isolate. That's the challenge. And when we look to, to the support payments that are available in England, as a conversation that I know is going on between our Department of Communities and the, the Department of Finance that met to make sure that we do get those support measures um, in place. Um, from the, the member from, from Foyle, when Gary actually raised to know about Everyone has a role to play in this, and not you know a lot of personal res responsibility. I don't think we can simply legislate or find our way out of this. If I could, I think we'd see a lot more draconian measures coming in. There is a role for enforcement and encouragement as well, um, but there is that onus and emphasis on personal responsibility. I think the majority of people in Northern Ireland are taking that upon themselves. But to that small minority, um, they are doing, and they do do damage. Um, again, I, I would echo his, his comments uh, in the role of local councils. I think the role of Derry City and Sturban uh, Council in, in the, past, the past few weeks ha has been an example to other council areas. And it's that piece of messaging and coordination at a local level and voices at a local level that have got, I, I think, people, people engaged. We haven't seen the, the outworkings or the decreases in numbers up there yet, but the message is now there. 
um, that was replicated across a number of other council areas as they see the incidents in their areas start to start to increase. Um, uh, Daniel McCrossan, um, then speaking, and I think it was Mr. Allister said, you know, speaking from that personal experience, which I think is so, so valuable uh, in this house as well. We now have a number of ministers uh, self-isolating as well because they've been in contact with somebody who is uh, who has been tested positive, and I think it goes to show that this virus um, is excusing nobody, is missing nobody, and there's nobody above it or 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 immune to it. Um, so what I would say to him, you know, he, he talked about the information that's available. I think there's a lot more information available on our dashboard, Mr Deputy Speaker, than, than people uh, actually realise in regards to hospitalisations, how many people are discharged, and in regards to that, that's broken down by, by, by quite detailed information, as, as well as the, the hospital admissions. And people going into ICU, the breakdown for positive cases by age group per council area, and also there's a lot of lot of information there. But he also raised a, another challenge that's out there, and it's one that's often repeated. You know that this is a lesser strain. No, it's not. There's nothing to prove that this is a lesser strain. It goes back to the point earlier that we now have better ways to to treat it. We know, you know in, in the in the most of cases, how to treat it. We know what medications now work. We have medications now, which we didn't have at the start. So the dangerous narrative then falls that this is something that people don't have to worry about. It's no worse than, than a minor flu. But one of the things that, again, that, that he raised, that has been raised across this piece, is that of enforcement um, and compliance. And that's why I welcome, that's why I asked for uh, the group to be set up within the executive that does work across departments and outside agencies to get that, that larger increase on emphasis on enforcement uh, and compliance so that we can see um, and give a clear signal uh, to those people who are abiding by, by the guidance, by the regulations, that anybody who thinks they're above it or anybody who thinks uh, they're bigger than them, they will be, they will be held to account. Uh, Sinead Bradley then commented, and well, she was called without knowing she was going to be called. But what I will say is, Mr. Speaker, Deputy Speaker, I thank her for her comments because I, she came with that heartfelt um, approach to, I think, that message and the does need to come out um, from this place. And I think, to, you know, it's what we can do for others. This is a balancing act. There is no, there is no win-win in this. This is about making the best decision out of what we have so that we can prevent the collapse of our health service, prevent more people getting COVID, but also ensure that our education and our economy service, our, our education and our economy you know, goes on ahead as it is. There is no absolute, and you're right in saying that. So many people expect there to be an absolute or want there to be an absolute or ask for there to be an absolute or call for the executive to produce that absolute, but there is none. This is done from, from perspective, from um, personal understanding and from approaches that we as an executive, we as an assembly and we as a society have to intact. But one of, one of the most important words um, she used was out of empowerment. And it's the action of the individual, it's the action of the communities uh, to support those people who need that help, should it be from COVID, should it be from self-isolation, should it be from mental health challenges. And that's the challenge that we also have to address as well. Her final comments was, you know, more may need to be done because we are in this together. And that's the reaction. And I think that is the general message that is coming from, from society and from Northern Ireland as, as a whole. Um, Mr. Allister then moved to actually talk about the regulations and the detail in it, as I was expect that, that he would. Uh, the paragraph he refers to is after consulting with the CMO and the CSA, I can make that direction. And what I would say to him, if he thinks that my executive colleagues are so timid and afraid of me that they simple, simply go with, with what I say without challenge or, or contrast or putting forward a different opinion, I wish his impression was right. Because it would make this, this whole piece of work uh, an, awful, an awful lot easier. But they are, and he's right, you know, by the detail of the law, interpretation of the law as drafted, it does give me phenomenal power. 
but he knows me well enough that the utilage and the use of that power is something that I would take very seriously and wouldn't be doing without that um, guidance or consult consultation with the CMO, CSA and also uh, my executive colleagues. He referred to uh, those anonymous sources in the media uh, and I would say to, to Mr Alistair and he's, he's long standing in this house in the legal profession if he would base a legal argument on anonymous sources that he heard quoted uh, on Radio Ulster um, I don't think he would as a professional or as a politician so I'll not um, I'll not engage in that debate that was solely set out to try and set a direction of of conversation before that conversation has in fact um, been had because he's right and it's something I've always said Mr Deputy Speaker the impact of what we do must be balanced and it must be balanced by the executive as a whole uh, and it's about uh, me putting forward my case as health minister to ensure that our service isn't overwhelmed and doesn't run into the same challenges that we did uh, in the first wave Today, with 22 people in ICU, 140 people in inpatient beds, that's 140 people that need nursed, uh, need supported by auxiliary workers, need supported by our domestic staff, need fed, need looked after. That's 140 inpatients that are in beds where they rightly need to be while they combat COVID, but it's 140 beds that I can't use or our health service can't use um, for all our patients. And he used um, the debate was of, of, of community uh, immunity. Um, how that comes about and where it comes will be by a vaccine, will be the implementation of a vaccine, by an uptake of a vaccine, because we still don't even know how long um, that vaccine will be potent for. So it's not about going out there and seeing how we can survive. We don't do that with flu. We don't deal with polio and another number of other medical challenges um, that modern society have faced and combat by, by vaccination as well. So that's where the stage comes, simply letting this virus rip, as many interpret um, herd immunity. Now, I notice he's moved away from, from that phrase, and, and herd immunity to many is simply just letting this virus go and see where it ends up. It's not something that I support as a health minister. It's not something I think that I don't think it's something he means I am. To the minister. Um, so the message of the minister is, until there's a vaccine, the only response we have to an upsurge in cases is to clamp down with various shades of lockdown. That's the only strategy there is. Is it not the case that the balance of the scientific evidence suggests that people who have had COVID acquire some element of immunity. Is that right or wrong? Um, and I think you know, the members point some level of, of immunity, which we do not know yet. This is still a new virus. This only came here. We had our first case in Northern Ireland in February. Um, and members keep saying you know, what we knew eight months ago. Eight months ago, this scared... Um, I'll not use the language that's in the back of my head, but I know how I felt as Health Minister at that point in time. Um, so in regards, and I think it's the point I used earlier on and he uses as well, it's about how we live with this virus. We will live with this virus by various shades, and I not use lockdown, but various shades of implementation of regulation and restriction. And that should be in proportionate as to how we see the increase in cases, in hospitalizations, and in ICUs and missions. If it was simply about positive cases on a standalone basis, that did not lead to the hospital, hospital admissions that we've seen, and we've seen increasing um, over the past seven days, that we will see increase further over the next seven days. And those hospitalizations lead to further ICU admissions and lead to further death. So when the admission is, uh, when the translation of this virus is, when it comes from positive cases, hospitalizations, ICU admissions, and then potential death, we have to learn to live with this virus. We learn to live with it by bringing in the regulations and the restrictions that we have to date. There is only one set of steps that we know work, and that's what we used earlier at the beginning of this year. 
but we have to make sure they're proportionate and balanced. So, Mr. Mr. Chambers. Do you agree that if we do go down the road of herd immunity, that effectively what we are doing is sacrificing the most weakest and most vulnerable of our society to this virus? That is the interpretation of, of many out there. That's what a herd, herd immunity means. It's not actually what Sw Sweden practised, even though it's what many claim that Sweden have practised. Mr Deputy Speaker, we all have a responsibility to help curb the spread of the virus. We do that by maintaining social distancing, maintaining good hand hygiene and respiratory hygiene, um, by wearing face coverings, by self-isolating immediately if we experience any symptoms, including a new persistent cough, a fever, or a loss or change of smell or taste. We do that by seeking a test if we experience any of these symptoms, by downloading the Stop COVID NI app and complying with the restrictions and the regulations in place. Mr Deputy Speaker, by following this advice, as we go about our daily lives, we can protect ourselves and others from serious illness, protect our health service and our economy and our education service, and help avoid further prolonged and more stringent restrictions. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move these regulations. Members, the question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 4, Regulations NI 2020 be approved. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. I would ask members to take their ages for a few moments.